All right. The interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. The veteran's name is James Wall. They were born March 18th, 1920. They served in the United States Air Force. He achieved the rank of Captain. Captain. Um, I am John Richter. We are recording this on March 18th, 2014. I am John Richter, and I am conducting the interview. No relation. Mr. Wall, how are you doing today? Fine. Now, you were born in Grapevine, Texas. Correct. How was life growing up for you? Pretty tough during the Depression. During the Depression? Um, what were some of, I guess, some of your first memories from childhood and um, things that, you know, strike you or things that you remember very well from growing yeah. up? Several things. Trip at the age of three from Grapevine, Texas to, uh, Tennessee, Tennessee to attend my uncle's wedding. I was three years old <laughs> and it took five days to get there. Five the days, yeah. wow. And uh, I grew up in a little town and my father was a town pharmacist uh -huh. and he had the only drugstore in town. So I started working in that by the time I was nine or ten years old. Oh wow! So, <laughs> but uh, we lived a pretty good life, you know. That's good. And uh, I got interested in airplanes very early. Okay. And we, every time we'd hear one, we'd run out to see it. <laughs> <laughs> but every now and then, a barnstormer would land in a field outside of town and take people up for short rides. But it was uh, beyond my financial ability <laughs> to hitch a ride during those years. And uh, but I did manage to get a scholarship and went to <coughs> school at Texas A&M. Okay. But that also put me in the Army Reserve okay. <coughs> after graduation from college. So I didn't get drafted or anything. I was actually ordered to active duty okay. from the reserves. Mm -hmm. In fact, an inter interesting sidelines, when I was in combat over in, over in India, Burma, I received my draft notice to report. <laughs> well, I'm already here. <laughs> I said, I, don't have a, I wrote a mask, I said, well, I'm already in combat in India, I'm going to have a hard time getting there for the draft. <laughs> Now, when did you, you said you joined the, the Army straight out of, out of college, or? No, I graduated from college in 1940. Okay. And, but I got orders to report to active duty, actually during the summer of 1941. And interestingly enough, my first orders that I received, I was to report for active duty December 7th, 1941, which is Pearl Harbor. Wow. And uh, I was working for the Procter & Gamble Company so they asked to have it postponed for four weeks so I could finish what I was working on. But of course, in Pearl Harbor, the next day I got a telegram and said report. So I was, I actually reported in on December 14, 1941. But I went to spend the first year of the war in Washington, D.C., working in the War Department as a young second lieutenant. Okay. Well, what? But found out I could keep my commission go through flight training, so I transferred to the Air Corps and went through flight training. Okay. And what, while you were in D.C., what kind of what kind of jobs did you do with the... With the we were working mainly on the uh, called transportation and issue section of the Chemical Warfare Service. We were really dealing with uh, the purchasing and shipping of uh, mortars and ammunition that went with it. Also, we were dealing with the production of poison gas. Okay. Which thankfully was never used in World War Two. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> but I was young lieutenant in the in the department that managed all that for the for the army. But then I departed in December forty two and from then on it was Air Force. <laughs> now where did you uh, where did you first report for Air Force training? San Antonio, Texas. San Antonio? Oh everybody that, that uh, once the flight training started in San Antonio, it was pre-flight. Okay. It's called San Antonio Aviation Cadet Center, SAC. 
and from there you had to pass your physical exams first before you qualified to be part of the cadet program. And uh, then after a month or so there, then they started, they shipped us out and started our flight training. Okay. And what kind of, I guess, what kind of things did you go through while you were in SAC? Was it more of just kind of a basic boot camp? Or it basic boot camp. And uh, uh, even though I was a student officer, we were, uh, we worked with aviation cadets alongside. We did everything they had to do. Okay. You know, all the long hikes and the physical, physical uh, uh, conditioning programs that we went through. It was regular boot camp. Just like just like anything in the military. Okay. They worked your tails off. <laughs> they toughened you up at the same time. That's good. And then after two months of that, then we started in flight training. Okay. And where did you go for flight training? Went to Vernon, Texas for primary. <clears throat> and <clears throat> that was with a, a low wing Fairchild PT-19 primary trainer. It was open cockpit job. Okay. When we started with them, they were fabric covered airplanes probably had all 90 horsepower <laughs> and uh, then uh, after two months of that we went to basic training and that was in Enid Oklahoma and uh, here you advance to a more powerful airplane still a fixed gear job and, and two months there and then after basic then you split some of you went to single engine, some of you went to multi engine. If you went to single engine, you were headed to fighters. If you went to multi engine, you were headed for headed to bombers. And I went to single engine at uh, Victoria Field in uh, Texas, Foster Field in Victoria, Texas, excuse me. And then when we graduated there, we got our wings. Uh -huh. And I was already a first lieutenant, but then all my classmates that were cadets received their commission and became second lieutenants. And then that wasn't the end of our training. Instead of joining uh, a, a fighter group, we went to train what called replacement training units for another couple months of training. Here we trained in fighters. We flew P-40s. Uh -huh. Did uh, aerial gunnery, dogfighting, Dive bombing, skip bombing, strafing the whole nine yards, night night flying, night formation flying, uh, the whole thing for another couple of months, and then we went back and waited to sign overseas, and uh, I got shipped overseas in about two weeks after I finished. Okay, and where did you where went, did you end up going when you went overseas? I went to India. Went to India, and we basically started flying our combat over Burma. Uh, at that time, the Japanese occupied half of Burma, and they still occupied ha and they occupied half of China too. But we had air forces in China. Fourteenth Air Force was operating in China uh, in support of the Chinese troops. But uh, they had to be, all of their gasoline and supplies and everything had to be flown in by by transport plane over the Himalaya mountains, so called flying the hump. Uh -huh. Dangerous duty, it really was a dangerous duty. And all all that time we were involved in trying to reopen a land route to China to get supplies up there, and we were we were flying mostly mostly what we were flying we were flying uh, P fifty ones at that time, but we were flying mostly uh, uh, ground support missions supporting ground troops that were trying to clear northern northern Burma enough so that we could get a land route into China for moving and supplies up there. Now did you get to fly fly the hump yourself, I guess you'd say? Well, I flew it one time because my whole squadron got transferred to China okay. in uh, late October 1944. And we were put on three bases in western China around the town called Chengdu. Uh, that were established for the B-29s to bomb Japan from, which is what B-29s were doing at that point. But that mission of the B-29s lasted only 
maybe six months. And then when, when the military, Navy, Marines, and Army liberated uh, Guam and Saipan, all the B-29s left China mm -hmm. and, went, and went to Saipan and Guam, which was a lot closer to Japan. Yes. In which they, uh, in fact, the atom bomb was launched from one of those islands. Okay. Now, did you, how, how would you say, what was daily life like for you while you were stationed over in India and China? Well, if, well, it's pretty casual, really, because if we didn't have a mission to fly, at least in India, uh, what, by the time I got there, the Japanese had, had quit trying to bomb over in bomber air bases in India uh, because, I guess because they really got slaughtered every time they came over uh, because they couldn't, their fighters couldn't fly that far and the bombers would become unescorted. So we were doing to them what the Germans were doing to us in Europe. Uh, and so we didn't have to worry about that. So if we were all, I don't know, we food around, we played cards. <laughs> One time some of us got some motorcycles out of Boulder Pool and went tearing around northern India. And we got in trouble for that. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> then that was pretty simple there. Then uh, in May of 1944, <clears throat> the Japanese briefly invaded India from Burma and surrounded a, a British garrison in a place called Imphal. And they had to be supplied by air. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, the Japanese fighters were just making hash out of these guys that were trying to, you know, transport planes. No contest with a yeah. fighter. A fighter just coming in and blows them out. They're just slow. And so <laughs> they moved our whole squadron to southern India, all 24 planes and 30 pilots. And uh, we got ready in the first, first day when the British reported that the Japanese were at Imphal, our whole squadron took off and flew over central Burma and was waiting for the Japs when they came home. And that one day, Squadron shot down 13 Japanese aircraft. Oh wow! And but I was a replacement pilot. I didn't get to go on that one. <laughs> I got to go on the third one. They did it again the next day, and then they did it again the third day. I got to go on the third day, and by then, boy, they were waiting for us. <laughs> the Japanese didn't fall for it this time. They sent a token force up to Imphal and kept the main forces, their airplanes, over a place called Maitila in Burma. And we got over there, they were all over us. Bad it was. <laughs> <laughs> and my guys flying wing with and I chased one Jap all over the sky. We never did we never did hit him. <laughs> we shot and shot and shot. And it was very frustrating. But uh <clears throat> Then, then we, when the, they pushed them back, they pushed the Japanese back, mm -hmm. back into Burma, and re relieved them fall. And when they did, they sent us back to northern India, and we started flying over northern Burma again in support of ground troops until they moved us to China. Okay. Now, were you, while you were flying over India, you were, obviously you were just telling me about the the dog fights that you. Uh, I guess, how many dogfights would you say you got got into while you were in the during the course of your your flying career? With uh, enemy planes, <laughs> no, we practiced a lot. With enemy planes, really only got into two. Okay, into two. They pretty yeah. pretty nerve wracking, or was it was a well? It happens fast. You don't have time, then you get scared to death after the fact. <laughs> Just kind of a reactionary thing. Yeah, we had, we had one terrible incident. Uh, we had a forward base down. They built in the jungle down in northern Burma, so they moved a, a half a squadron down there, so it would 
be just half as far to fly for any of our ground support missions. But we also were within range of Japanese bombers again, so we had to do what's called standing alerts. If you're standing alert, you had your parachute in, in your plane, and the crew chief would warm it up every hour so you didn't have to go through anything. So that uh, then if you got scrambled, all I did, you'd just run, jump in, put your parachute on, and take off. No matter what you're wearing. <laughs> no, we, we had okay. our flight suits on because we were we were on duty. Okay. We were on duty. It's called standing alert. Okay. And uh, we got we got scrambled. A flight of four of us. We took off. One guy's canopy blew off, so he turned around, and went back. So it was just three of us. And they sent us south from this place, and they said that uh, the forward base that they had uh, they had an airfield that they just about liberated the northern uh, Burma but that it was under air attack and we were to proceed down there and, and relieve it if we could, do whatever we had to do. Anyway, <clears throat> we went down about 10,000 feet and started circling about the second circle of the flight leader, a guy named Jack Emery called it and says, there they are. We looked, the number two guy, and I was a tail in Charlie, and I both called and said, Jack, those are B-25s. He said, no, they're not. They're Japanese Bettys. Now, come on. Mm -hmm. And with that, he, he peeled off, and we went, we went with him. And uh, within, oh, it was 10 seconds, I guess, I wasn't going to point my nose at those bombers. They were B-25s, damn it. I wasn't going to shoot them. <laughs> so I, slid, I, I broke formation. I went way out the side, and Jack barreled up and back into that formation, and they blew his ass right out of the sky. Wow. I mean, his plane is just... Stuff that's coming out of the play just went like that in the ground. And by the time I got even with the B-25s, I was 100 yards to the right mm -hmm. of the formation. And there were eight Japanese fighters that were attacked in front of the B-29s that were attacking them. Oh wow! So it was you were coming from behind, and they were coming from in front. Yeah, we were coming from behind, and the Japanese behind the formation going this way. We were coming from behind. And the Japanese were up in front making head on pass, I guess making head on passing. I flew right into four of them. Wow. And the number two man went under the formation somewhere. And I never saw him again. And suddenly I've got four Japanese fighters to contend with. And you're just by yourself. I'm by myself. <laughs> so I picked out one and pulled in on him and shot him up as best I could. And his buddies were on my butt in a fraction. It was very dark, very cloudy. It was rainy season then. And we all went down through the clouds. And I outran them and got underneath the clouds. And then I couldn't find anybody. I couldn't find anybody after that. I was all by myself. So I, I just finally just made my way back to base. But it was dark. And sure enough, the other number two guy came in about five or ten minutes after I did. And, uh, he swore and he had seen Jack again, but Jack never showed up, mm -hmm. flight leader. And he was found in his wreckage of his plane uh, when the ground troops got into that part of Burma. He was he terrible mistake. He mm -hmm. attacked their own airplanes. Oh, wow. They blew him out of the sky. And, uh, but he and the number two man had fired at the B-25s and they killed one guy in B-25. And uh, they nearly court-martialed the guy that survived, but they couldn't couldn't tell which one had been had been the culprit. Yeah. So they didn't court-martial him. But it was a terrible incident. And what was wrong with that guy, I don't know. But the B-25s are such distinctive looking airplanes, the Japanese didn't have anything that looked like it. Mm -hmm. I have never to this day understood that. Never. Interesting. Interesting. Either his eyesight had gotten awful bad, fog of which I suspect. Uh -huh. I suspect his eyesight had gotten bad and he covered it up. Mm -hmm. But uh, it cost him his life. He didn't survive. Well, it's good that you made it out of there, though, especially with, with four, four different Japanese players. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, I, pulled up, I pulled four fighters off the bus. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> the bombers and the bombers got away. Well, that's good. And they got away. They they returned home without a loss of an airplane, but they did lose one guy. Well, that's impressive. But uh, mm -hmm. so I did, as far as I know, I never did. I hit one of them, but you know, I don't know whether he went down or not. I was busy. There were there were there were bigger things on your mind getting yeah. out getting out at that point. <laughs> yeah, friend, they call it friendly fire, and that's that's a lot of crap. <laughs> nothing friendly about getting hit with bullets. Oh no. Now in I, fact, I I became a victim of friendly fire myself in China. Really? Yeah. What happened with that? If you don't mind. Uh, my wingman shot me down. <laughs> we were uh, strafing a locomotive, which means you're at ground level. Uh huh. And you're in trail like this. Uh huh. And he was too close to me, and he started shooting before I got out of the way. And I got all these ricochets off this old steam locomotive. Really? It blew out my radiators, my oil and coolant radiators both. And I was able to fly for only about 10 more minutes. But I didn't get far enough away so the Japs got me. Really? Yeah. No, um, I guess that was, did the, you know, was, was, I'm trying to formulate a, a question here. Was it? You know, there's obviously a lot of terrible stories about, you know, prisoners of war, you know, it, was it a, I guess, were you, were you treated fairly or was it something, you know? Oh, no, no, they, the, didn't, they didn't obey the rules at all. They'd beat up on you and starve you and freeze you and all kind of stuff. Uh, and, uh, but, if I could pick a place to go down, North China was probably the best because most of those Japanese soldiers there had been there for a long time and a lot of them had, had, had never fired a shot in anger. Mm -hmm. They'd never seen any combat because Japan really took over, pretty much took over that part of China in about 1937 and this is 1944. Mm -hmm. I was a curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting in jails, the LA soldiers come in, squat down, and look at me, <laughs> look at me. So I'd look at them and say, "You yellow son of a bitch, <laughs> what do you think?" <laughs> and they just grin or laugh or something. It was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, B-29 guys bail out over Japan. Their survival rate was very low. They got a lot of them got killed. And uh, after they landed, I don't think anybody really knows. I've heard a lot of uh, statistics said that 5% of the Americans that went down from bombers over Japan survived. Oh, wow. Uh, if they happened to land where the Army troops would pick them up, they usually survive. But if they land among the civilians, they were just in the process of dropping bombs on them. They beat them to death, mm -hmm. or kill them with pitchforks or anything they could lay their hands on. Mm -hmm. It was brutal. Now, how did you? How long were you uh, a prisoner for? Uh, actually, only nine months. Okay. I was shot down in December 1944, and war was over in August, following August. And then uh, we got out about a month later. Okay. We were there for another month. That war was over. Um and. How, how I guess how was the process of, of being transferred back to the U.S. Did they did they just kind of pull you out of the cell one day and say we're we're sending you home? No, uh, we we stayed really really uh, I would say under the care of the Japanese for another four weeks. Okay. But during during that period, uh, they saw that we were taken care of and fed and and uh, got baths and everything. They, they really <clears throat> uh, went all out to take care of us. This old Japanese colonel said, we want you to go home in good health. <laughs> Some of us were at that point. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, uh, they had to mark all POW camps so they could be seen from the air. <clears throat> and the B-29s would fly over. This is after the surrender. Mm -hmm. Clear all through, 
and beat that knives would fly over and drop us supplies and stuff, except. And then on September the 12th, the Japanese were notified that there were planes coming in to the local airport near where the camp I was in, and were going to pick us up and take us out. And they took us there for you. We got on planes and went all the way to the Philippines. Interesting. Yeah. Now, how was life like for you coming back from being a prisoner of war into, you know, into American society? And was it a tr tough transition, or not was it... really? Okay. Not really. Uh, no, everybody welcomed us home, and everybody was very uh, solicitous of us, and took good care of us, and everything. That's excellent. And the army did too, because. Uh, <clears throat> See, the war is over August 15th, and I did not, I did not get home until October the 20th. Oh wow! Over two months. Mm -hmm. But I sure was eating a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the problems. One of the real problems of of POW with Japanese is starvation. How much would you say that you had to eat while you were a prisoner, like over the course of a week? Or so? Well, I had it was divided up. Uh, my first six months I spent in the jail in Beijing, China. I got two bowls of rice a day, about that much. And that was it. Okay. All. And just for, for a month or two straight, or a couple months straight, that's all you got? Was six just, months. Six months straight, just rice every well, single I would, day. I was pretty skinny when I came out of that one. But then the rations were a little bit better from then on. And then, of course, as soon as the war was over, the Japanese gave us all the more deep. We just stuffed ourselves. I can believe it. <laughs> um, now, after, when did you end up, uh, I guess, leaving the military? In 46? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> when I came home, uh, we landed in San Francisco. Okay. And uh, on off a troop ship. Took three weeks to get across the Pacific on the, on the ship. And we went into the Letterman General Hospital there, and they checked us up. They filled, I had 10 teeth filled at one sitting. Oh, wow. God, I'm telling you, I don't know if I'm die with that. And then we rode on a, like a hospital train from there to Temple, Texas. Okay. And then uh, I was given 90 days sick leave mm -hmm. to go anywhere I wanted. Okay. So they more or less turned me loose. And, and, and uh, one other thing, I, uh, we got, the government gave us an R&R &R in Miami Beach for about two weeks and it was a free deal. <laughs> By then I was married, I took my wife with me, Ellen, and uh, it was a free deal in, in uh, Miami Beach for two weeks. And, uh, then I went back to work uh, about 1st of March, <clears throat> 46. Uh, company I worked for, for the war, Procter & Gamble Company. Okay. And now, after after your service in, in the military and the Air Force, um, what did you end up end up doing afterwards? I, I know you said well, you, I, you got married. Well, I graduated from college uh -huh. in 1940 and went to work for Procter & Gamble Company as, as a chemical engineer. Okay. And I went straight back there. Okay. And did you have any, end up having any kids or? Um, yeah, we, we had three kids. Okay. <laughs> did, did they, did you end up, uh, I guess, did they end up doing any military service? Or did no. you kind of persuade them against that? No. Or? <laughs> uh, had two girls and a boy. Okay. And my son had high draft number in the Vietnam War and never got called. Oh wow. Which I'm very fortunate. I'm very happy about it. But he would have gone if it had been if it oh, had wow. come up. But uh, no, I didn't encourage it, him at all in the military. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact I stayed I stayed with the Air Reserve for about a year and a half after the war was actually flying P fifty ones again. Okay. And uh trouble is one of my one of my co workers at Procter and Gamble was also a pilot and he was flying fifty one and he got killed. 
crash. Left a widow with a young child, and she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And we had a brand new child, and that was the end of my flying career. I understand. <laughs> Now, what, out of all the airplanes that you did fly throughout your career, would you say the P-51 was probably your Absolutely favorite? Absolutely the best airplane. <laughs> it was the best fighter plane in the World War II period. It was superior It was superior to even the best of the German fighters. Mm -hmm. And the ME-109 was a hell of a fighter plane. That's true. That's, yeah. But uh, with uh, equal skills, pilots, mm -hmm. P-51 would defeat the ME-109 nearly every time. Now, um, I guess you say, did you, um, I know pilots are known for kind of, you know, panning up their planes or, you know, giving, you know, putting their own little insignia. <laughs> did did you did, have any on yours? <laughs> no. Uh, <clears throat> when I, I was a replacement pilot, so I didn't have an airplane. Okay. I always had to, I had to fly somebody else's airplane all the time. And when I went to China, I finally got my own airplane. But it was my first mission in China. I blew it up. <laughs> <laughs> I never paid, never did anything with it. So you get to keep it. <laughs> I crashed that sucker in a pile of junk. Oh man, did you? I'm guessing you parachuted before yes, you crashed. I did. Okay. What? What? I guess. What were some of your thoughts as you're, you know, kind of floating through the sky and? Well, I, I was out in the countryside in China. What I was thinking, what I was thinking when I landed, I picked up my parachute <clears throat> and I found some. I thought were Chinese nationalist soldiers, Chinese. And the history in China was that nine out of ten Americans pilots that went down inside enemy territory, the Chinese would get them out. Mm -hmm. And what happens? When, when they get you out, you can't fly combat there anymore. Mm -hmm. They send you home. Mm -hmm. So, man, I was thinking about, man, I'm on my <laughs> way home. And until that night, these Chinese soldiers, for whatever reason, turned me over to Japs. Really? Yeah. Wow. But we'd been, we'd been strafing a locomotive in a, in a town that was garrisoned by the Japanese when I was hit. Mm -hmm. and. Somehow they must have known it, the Japanese. And I suspect they sent word out to the countryside and we know we know where that airplane is and the pilot is around and you turn them over to us or you're all dead. Japanese were brutal with the Chinese. Mm -hmm. In fact it, it has been estimated that that famous Doolittle raid on Tokyo in April of nineteen forty two which was a one-way mission with the planes all crashing in China and mm -hmm. got bailing out. Uh, the Jap it's estimated that the Japanese killed as many as 50,000 Chinese along the route that they had helped these American flyers out of, out of the area. Wow, just, just in retribution. In retribution. Wow. That is... That it was, was the Japanese were terribly upset by that bombing mm -hmm. because it it was hard on the civilian morale because they'd been fed bill of goods about how good the Japanese army was and all, all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and the army they had been demonstrating it to them but that destroyed their idea of invincibility mm -hmm. and uh, Anyway, it was a long. I actually flew uh, 41 combat missions in total. Oh, wow. But uh, the missions over there weren't nearly as difficult as they were in Europe. Mm -hmm. we, had, we had a lot of missions over north of Burma where <clears throat> we didn't have a little ground fire against us, but we wouldn't. Like I said, I only saw Japanese. I only had two, two, two instances with Japanese fighters. The only mm -hmm. time I ever saw them. Well, is there, you know, looking back at it now, is there, is there anything that, you know, for, especially for somebody studying World War II, especially in you know, the the Eastern Theater of War, um, is there is there anything that you would, you know, piece of information or anything that that 
kind of gets overlooked or that should you know should be conveyed or something that needs you know people need to know about that it kind of well, one one thing one important consideration is that uh, China is probably the reason that we got into World War II in the first place. Mm -hmm. The logic of that is this. In 1938, there was a famous incident in Nanking, China, was referred to as the Rape of Nanking. Mm -hmm. And what it was, it was a garrison of soldiers in Nanking, of Chinese soldiers, 30,000 of them. Mm -hmm. And the Japanese army swarmed, had a lot more people, and surrounded these guys and they surrendered. Mm -hmm. The Japanese proceeded to kill every damn one of them. Mm -hmm. And then they, they got on, I, I don't understand it completely and don't know it completely, but for some reason they went on a rampage through the whole city of Nanking. And it was called a rape in Nanking because they raped every female they could find and they were, they were on a killing spree. The Japanese soldiers just went wild. And after that was, that was late 1938, and after that, <clears throat> what a lot of people don't know is we were almost the sole supply for Japan's oil. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in 1938, we were a big oil exporter, mm -hmm. crude oil exporter. It looks kind of funny now, but that was the truth at that time. Totally. And as a matter of fact, <laughs> uh, in President Roosevelt, in fact, said to the Japanese, you would get out of China or we're not shipping you any more oil or any more steel. We quit, we quit selling them steel too, which we've been doing a lot of. So the Japanese imperial ambitions that they had in order to pursue them, they had to have petroleum. And the nearest petroleum was in Indonesia. And at this time, in 38, all they occupied was China. They didn't occupy Thailand, Burma, or Singapore, or any of the Philippines, or any of that area. Mm -hmm. And they knew that to get to Indonesia, they were going to have to come in conflict with both the British and the Americans. Mm -hmm. So they decided the way to do it was not to try to knock out our fleet at Pearl Harbor as a, as a sneak attack rather than declaring war. So, and that that put us in World War Two. Interesting. Interesting. Well, in fact, the Japanese, while I was prison, the Japanese said, "War's your fault," you know. <laughs> and they'll tell me this story. Interesting. Well, thank you, Mr. Wall, for your time, and You're I welcome. I appreciate sitting down to talk to you. It's been sure, really. quite interesting. Thank you very much.